In 1921, a small army of government bureaucrats began streaming into Palau. Dressed in white linen uniforms with starch collars, they were to administer Japan's new colony. Karora Palau would be the capital. Branch offices were established in each of the six regions. Saipan, Palau, Yap, Chuk, and Ponape, in addition to the marshals. The Japanese, they called uh, their government here as Nangyocho. And Nangyocho can translate into literally means the South Seas government. You know, the Japanese somehow have a romantic view of Micronesia. White-clad civil servants soon were everywhere. They staffed the offices of a large government bureaucracy that oversaw all aspects of island life. They scuttled in pith helmets over village paths as teachers, medical aides, agriculture extension agents, and policemen. The size of the Japanese administration stood in sharp contrast with the small German administration some years before. By the mid-1920s, there were 900 civil servants, and 10 years later there were 1,400. The Japanese Navy had swept into the islands at the start of World War I to annex the former German possessions. At the end of the war, with the strong support of Britain, Japan secured formal authority over the islands against U.S. opposition. In 1919, at the Paris Peace Conference, the islands were entrusted to Japan to be governed as a mandated territory under the newly founded League of Nations. Japan was to be given full recognition of the administering authority of the islands it had taken from Germany in 1914. Why was Japan so interested in Micronesia? Japan, being the most powerful country in Asia at that time, you know, like any European colonial power, they wanted to establish overseas uh, colonies. It was natural that the country should look south, beyond the Bonin Islands, to the islands in which Japanese traders had been active for 30 years. So it was looking southward to Micronesia with the uh, covetous eyes, you know. Micronesia offered Japan access to the riches of the entire South Pacific. Japan intended to extend its influence into the islands and to turn a profit at the same time. According to their League of Nations mandate, the Japanese were to promote material and moral well-being and the social progress of the islanders. In other words, they were to bring these people the blessings of civilization. Civilization, that is, with a strong Japanese flavor. The Japanese administration 
was very, very intense and it was really in your face, you know, and overwhelming. Uh, and it sort of awed the Micronesians. There were early signs of success, according to a journalist who visited the Marshalls in 1920. The women wear their hair in the Japanese style. Their wardrobe is not complete if they do not have a colored Japanese fan and a multi-hued kimono. The young islanders are like Japanese cadets in their khaki outfits and black caps. In short, since 1914, there has been a complete cultural revolution in the Marshalls. Thomas McMahon, 1920. But the Marshalls was not the whole of Micronesia. The island group had a head start in modernization thanks to the longer and more intense period of German rule. Elsewhere in Micronesia, there was more resistance to new ways. In Palau, for example, a reactionary group known as Morengue was formed. Mordokune is a, uh, it's like a religion. And they use it as a way to resist Japanese occupation of Palau. But most Micronesians quickly accepted this newly imported culture. I have a friend, a Japanese, small boy. We start to use the stick, haki. So I'm the one who did stick whenever I go. So they say, oh, who says that's Japanese? We know that we want to do that, we want to do that, we want to do that, we want The civilization that the Japanese hoped to promote, though, went far beyond the type of dress they wore and the kinds of food they ate. It embraced the way they looked at life, how they thought, and what they believed. Profound changes needed to take place if Micronesians were to be truly civilized, Japanese administrators felt. And how might this be done? The Japanese representative to the League of Nations spelled out their approach. Education and religion are the two methods most likely to ensure in the long run the educational development of the inhabitants. These are the most appropriate and the effective means of developing a civilized people. Mitsusada Horiguchi, 1920. The Japanese administration was not long in taking action. Admiral Yamamoto appealed to the Pope for priests and brothers, and soon Spanish Jesuits were sent to open a new mission in the islands. Four pastors from the Japanese Congregational Church also arrived to begin work in Chuk and Pohnpei. German Liebenzell missionaries were invited to resume their work and set up new stations in the West. And so, non-Christian Japan brought in missionaries to assist in its civilizing missions. 